Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Welcome to this closing plenary of the Jobs Reset Summit, a call to action for resetting the social contract. Um, I'm Sadia Zahidi from the World Economic Forum. Welcome to all of you. You just heard in that video, the co-chairs and leaders involved with this summit lay out very precisely the challenges that we're facing, but also the huge opportunity that this crisis offers us to be able to make a change and quite fundamentally reset the social contract. Now, I have the great pleasure of having with us our founder and executive chairman and four global shapers that I will introduce shortly. But I did want to thank the many of you that have been involved in these conversations over the last four days. We had over 170 leaders and organizations join the conversations. Over a thousand people that joined our platform through the World Economic Forum. And nearly half a million people that watched all of the live stream conversations and millions more that were reached through social media. I think the reason for this strong resonance has been how critical this topic of economic growth and revival, of the jobs reset, of education, skills, and lifelong learning, and of equity, inclusion, and social justice is today. I'd also particularly like to thank the 16 co-chairs of the summit that really took on each of the four days themes and drove forward um, not only the development of the program and the conversations and their networks, but this event is just the start of that conversation. They will be carrying forward a number of these initiatives with us um, and helping create that better vision and better outcomes for the economy, for jobs, for skills, and for equity. Now for today, we want to try to do something that is an almost impossible task, which is bring home four days of conversations and start talking about what might be the highlights, the priorities, and then of course, the key features of this new social contract. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists. Um, Klaus Schwab is, professor, uh, is a founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Professor Schwab. Thank you. And then we have four global shapers. The shapers are a community of young people under the age of 30 in 400 city hubs, um, even more, uh, 400 and counting around the world. And we're joined by Jumi from Nigeria, Leti from Mexico, Parv from Chicago, and Panos from Greece. Now, I know that they're all in different locations at the moment, but I'm giving you their country of origin, and I'm addressing them with their nicknames. Um, you should absolutely go and take a look at their very illustrious um, biographies. Professor Schwab, I'm going to turn it over to you first. What were your key highlights, takeaways, and priorities from the last four days of discussions? Thank you very much, uh, Sadia. I have three major takeaways. First, the World Economic Forum is now very much engaged into this initiative of shaping a great reset for the post-corona era. And of course, uh, the objective of this reset is to make the world more resilient, more sustainable, and also more fair and more inclusive. Now, in order to make the world more fair and inclusive, I think the key word is jobs. And uh, here I have learned during the, the um, summit um, many aspects of how we should approach, let's say, uh, the creation of skills for tomorrow and so on. But the second, the second uh, for me, uh, major element um, was um, we need to address this issue, not just in terms of what policies, what we, we need, but also in terms of changing our mindset. And here, um, uh, what is at the forefront is to create a new model, a new concept, a new uh, definition of capitalism. Uh, capitalism in the old uh, definition comprises only financial capital, but actually human and social capital is as, and of course, natural capital is as important as financial capital. And for me, 
this means to enhance even our um, uh, steps, our important um, steps we are undertaking to have uh, business leaders accepting to report on the ESGs. But one of the highlights for me was the launch of um, the uh, dashboard for a new economy, uh, because it means that governments should also be measured and judged not only in terms of GDP um, uh, goals, but on the basis of the four Ps, uh, prosperity, people, uh, planet, and uh, principles for good governance. And finally, in all the sessions, that's my third conclusion, practically in every session, it was evident how much public-private cooperation is needed. So all those issues cannot be solved by governments, business, or civil society alone. We need uh, collaborative um, uh, efforts. And uh, I'm very happy that we have four global shapers because it's your world, which we are discussing here. And uh, to integrate you into this great reset uh, initiative is absolutely essential. Back to you, Sadia. Thank you very much. Uh, Jimmy, Professor Schwab just referred to this idea of broadening out beyond GDP and ensuring that as we head towards an economic revival, um, we are not relying only on the metrics of the past. Now, I know you were following closely uh, the discussions on day one on economic growth, revival, and transformation. Share with us your highlights and your key priorities moving forward. Thank you, Sadia. I think we need sound. Jumi, hold on for a second. Um, we're just gonna try to see if we can uh, ensure your sound is back up. Okay, we're gonna let um, our tech team work with you on ensuring that your sound is back on. It might be, might be an issue with the, with the headset. Letty, I'm gonna move it over to you because um, Professor Schwab also mentioned how jobs are basically the red thread that connect these four days. And if we have jobs, and if we do have better uh, learning and earning potential for everyone, uh, that could certainly help with some of the social challenges we face today. So let me come over to you. And if you could share with me your highlights and your key priorities from day two, and then I'm gonna come back to you, Jumi. Thank you so much, Saria, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I, I think that for me, uh, for day two, it was a big reminder on why it is important to have this conversation around the jobs, around work. Uh, and, and, and I think that um, I, I want to bring a couple of ideas. One is that it is incredibly important to talk about work because we spend one third, yes, one third of our adult life working. And this activity is rapidly evolving and has a great impact not only in our own quality of life, also in our communities and our countries. Uh, and this activity that we spend uh, a lot of time performing is rapidly evolving. The worlds of work and education are changing faster than ever. Uh, and I think that one of my key takeaways from the second day is that there are multiple forces shaping this change. One of them is, of course, technology. When we talk about the evolution of work, the future of work, we tend to think about technology immediately. But there are also other forces. For instance, uh, Linda Granton talked about uh, how life expectancy is growing and how we have many demographic changes that are also changing the, the nature of work. We talked about uh, climate change and migration as forces that are also shaping the world of work uh, and, and the intersection uh, in these two topics, climate refugees that should also have uh, decent and good job opportunities. And finally, uh, COVID as another imminent force that has uh, shaped how we work. Um, my final thought yeah, is that this challenge of the fast evolution of work is so big that one actor alone cannot tackle the challenge. We need really to work on multi-stakeholder collaboration between, of course, the private sector, but also companies looking to support their workforces, uh, technology companies that can map 
map potential job transitions, of course, uh, labor unions that are aware of the impact and community organizations. Uh, and in this last part, um, the Global Shapers community plays a big role. Uh, as co-chair of the Education and Employment Steering Committee, I want to ratify our commitment with the global youth, especially the more vulnerable populations. Uh, and we really want to continue as a steering committee to um, renew our commitment with the goal of strengthening market ready skills in 100,000 people, while also advocating for more inclusive workplaces. Uh, but of course, to, to actually deliver this reset of the social contract, we need to trust each other, we need uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration, and we need to be willing to adapt. Um, because uh, uh, I think that my, my final thought uh, and key takeaway is that the evolution of work, getting ready for the evolution of work is similar to sailing, in the sense that the pessimist will complain about the wind, the optimist will expect that the wind uh, is going to change, and the realist will adjust the sails. And to navigate to a better world of work, we need to be realist, adapt, and work together. Thank you. I think that is great advice for all of us. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, Jimmy, let me try and see if your sound is working again and we'll bring you back in for day one and your key highlights and priorities. Fortunately, we seem to have the same, same issue again. All right, we're gonna get the tech team to keep working um, on that and, and hopefully we bring you back. Try just one more time. No, unfortunately, that's not working. All right, um, we're gonna we're gonna come back to you. I'll come back to you last, so that gives us time to to resolve that issue. All right, um, Parv, you heard a uh, uh, from Letty the importance around sort of the future of work. But if we think about jobs being the big red thread, skills are really the currency of this new labor market that we're moving into. So tell us more about your priorities, your takeaways from day three. So I can speak about day four of the summit, um, focus on equity and inclusion, and then Panos can come back and talk about day three. So equity and inclusion are so often an afterthought, sprinkled atop existing plans, and our global systems were not designed to work for everyone. It really will take intentional effort to chart a path toward transformational change. And particularly in these times of fear and uncertainty, we have to keep showing up for black and brown youth and families, people living in poverty, people with disabilities, immigrants and refugees, women and girls, queer and trans people, and the planet. At the summit today, we heard about the business case for equity and justice, the need to walk the talk, to reimagine public policy processes, to reach those furthest behind the line of opportunity, and to push every person in a position of power to understand our power, privilege, and unconscious bias. I am very optimistic about the opportunity to reimagine the arrangements and structures that seemed normal, but have really been called into question and work together to build a more equitable and just society that works for everyone. So my call to action to organizations in the corporate and social sector and in government, we need to move beyond public statements and performative allyship and make diversity, equity, and inclusion a core business priority. How to do that. First, face into the data, the numbers and the narrative to honor the humanity of those furthest from opportunity. Listen to and work with people most affected by systemic inequities to co-create solutions. This means both improving access to leadership opportunities within your organizations and creating formal ways for community voice and engagement to play a role in decisions beyond just being informed or consulted. Second, institutionalize shifts in policies, resources, practices, and power to the priority populations you value. Conduct regular racial equity impact analyses of internal policies and processes, and proactively work to create an inclusive workplace that works for women and minorities. Hold leaders accountable to real data and metrics, tangible progress. Too often organizations think they're doing enough by creating spaces for training and development, but we know while it's important to prioritize resources to support employees to engage in anti-racism work, diversity training alone won't change behavior. It's all about structural and systems change. 
not just in your organizations, but in every institution. So we ask everyone to do your part to mobilize and catalyze cross-sector partners to do the same. So in closing, only by shifting power to communities of color can we really create this more equitable and just and inclusive society. So I call on everyone to make a commitment today to do your part to be a co-conspirator for justice. Thank you very much, Parv. I was doing a terrible job of following the appropriate order in terms of our speaking. Thank you for having corrected me and thank you for coming in with today's outcomes. And I'm not only very proud of all of the work that the Global Shapers are doing, but also the commitments that were made today by a number of businesses around racial justice, around disability inclusion, around gender equality, and around LGBTI inclusion. Um, I think this has been one of the most important achievements um, at the summit today, so thank you for that. Um, let me go to you, Panos, and come back to you with the skills-related question. Um, and I know that you've driven forward a very impactful initiative as well, so share with us your highlights and your priorities. Thanks, Aria, and congrats on uh, yet another uh, amazing summit. You know, having to deliver remarks after Parv feels like uh, having to sing uh, opera after Maria Callas, but I'll do I'll do my best. So three uh, three main uh, takeaways on my side is first on on the coordination side. I guess the silver lining of of COVID is that there is a growing realization that skills is now the new currency. And we really need to see this post-COVID momentum to foster coordination, both at a global, but also at a local level. Um, as a society, we are paying a very heavy price for uh, poor coordination efforts, uh, which amongst others, you know, accelerates inequality, hinders all recovery efforts across the, grow, across the, uh, the board. So uh, we really need a global trusted amplifier to lead those coordination efforts. And I believe that uh, the forum is uh, uh, by any measure the most befitting organization uh, to take up on this role. But we should not underestimate the local level as well. And uh, a great example is what you just uh, mentioned, the skills accelerator that we are jointly launching in Greece. And we are very excited about that to build on the amazing uh, impact that we had partnering with many of the organizations represented in your summit, like Microsoft, Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, and others uh, rolling out nationwide employment and skilling initiatives. Now, uh, point number two is really about automation and, and the impact on jobs. So McKinsey recently uh, ran a study looking on jobs and um, what it came out is no job is fully one thing. You've got you've to look into the constituent activities and the impact of AI in each one of them to really understand the landscape of risks and opportunities. So the, partner, the, the pattern that has emerged was that obviously we're going to have jobs gained, jobs lost, jobs changed, but the delta between jobs gained and jobs lost will be positive eventually, which is a good thing. Now, the tricky part is how we manage the transitions. Uh, uh, the share of jobs and occupations that can be fully automated in terms of all of their constituent activities is actually relatively small and it will remain so. So how we're managing those transitions uh, in terms of job change. Um, here at Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, we do a lot of research on how to design those new generation of deep technologies, having human at the center. So design those technologies to augment and complement versus replace humans, um, uh, in particular, given the 100 million or something uh, new tech jobs projected to be needed. Yeah as uh, your team announced yesterday. Uh, third point and final, and final on my side is really about empathy. So in those very trying, trying times, uh, whereas institutional alignment and action is of course critical, we should not forget of the importance of empathy and not only as a soft skills. Um, little acts of kindness can literally change people's lives as we've seen again and again with three generation in Greece. Uh, I can't help but uh, mention my uh, professor, former professor at the business school and renowned philanthropist, Laura Andreessen, who used to say that 
each one of us can be an individual philanthropist. We just need to pick our currency, whether it's capital, time, whatever sort of resources. So make no mistake, wherever you live, there is a civil society organization out there that needs you. We've, we are talking about skills. We've seen again and again across the world that the lack of social capital is a huge barrier to opportunity, in particular for youth. So whatever time you have available, please reach out, you know, mentor someone, help them to reskill, upskill themselves, uh, uh, teach them something, um, uh, help them to elevate their status. At the end of the day, beyond all this technical conversation on, on skills and jobs, we shall never forget that fundamentally uh, we rise by lifting others. So it's not about the future of work in abstract technical terms, but most critically about the future of workers and yep. the work of the future. Back to you, Sadia. Thank you, Panos. Thank you. A very critical reminder that um, skills are both technical and human and really are only going to be transferable if we are all speaking to each other, collaborating with each other. This is not just about a technical download of skills. So thank you for that. Uh, Jumi, let me try one more time. I really hope that we can now, now hear you. I hope you can too. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm really um, grateful for this opportunity. Um, I, I think I want to start by saying that um, the, the, the theme of or the topic um, of economic growth, revival and transformation really hit home for me, um, particularly at this time in my home country of Nigeria, where we are experiencing, um, as the rest of the world, uh, a healthcare shock, an economic shock, but also a social upheaval uh, where we have uh, young people who are uh, protesting for um, their right to end uh, police brutality, but also to see better governance and who really just want um, inclusive and sustainable economic growth and revival. And so the urgency of um, this uh, a summit um, really is not lost on me. Um, from the day one, uh, one of the major uh, points that I took home was that the direction of our vision is key. And that's because we will head um, in the direction of our vision. And so um, when we begin to think of ideas that were expressed, such as the concept of net zero on unemployment as the direction that corporates can envision as they look at um, ESG investing, so environmental, social, and corporate governance. And um, that's a concept that we need to really take um, to heart and ensure that we're, we're heading in that direction. Our eyes must really aim for a net zero um, on, on unemployment. And so as Panos was speaking about uh, upskilling not being an abstract con um, uh, concept that really hit home for me. Um, but corporates aren't the only stakeholders who um, need to have uh, their visions aligned. Um, policymakers are really the, the uh, levers, the greatest levers for social change. And so for policymakers, really it's back to the basics, investing in basic infrastructure, such as uh, broadband internet in order to bridge the digital divide, investing in education and across all age spectrums, right? So from very early childhood education to adult learning um, or, or reskilling, re um, but third, persisting um, with a mindset of optimism, uh, despite the, the hard truths of a broken social contract that many uh, young people around the world are feeling today. So it's the Stockdale paradox, if you will. We also need from governments um, active labor market policies. And something that I thought was quite interesting that I learned was uh, the, the need for trade finance instruments to help facilitate uh, shipment of goods across borders, even in this pandemic, and recognizing that indeed trade has literally been a, a lifesaver uh, for us during the pandemic. But not only do we need to adjust our vision, and even as um, Professor Schwab has underlined, we need to reset our minds. So um, having a mind shift from this concept of shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, we need to reset our thinking from um, really aiming for, for job security to employment security, where our focus is ensuring that the labor force can continue to train, reskill, retrain, and always be in a position to 
contribute to uh, the economy. Only then can we be guaranteed um, that we have uh, economic revival and all stakeholders, including young people, um, uh, are, are um, involved in. So what can young people do? I think there is, um, we've heard uh, some of my global shapers uh, share uh, their, their ideas and, and commitments, but individually also committing to lifelong learning and recognizing that we also have a proactive stance to take. We're not just being acted upon by other stakeholders, but we are agents of change in all right. And um, by really engaging in this uh, lifelong learning, we have an opportunity to ensure that not only are we getting knowledge, but we're connecting with others and building alliances and engaging with different stakeholders to ensure that um, we really have that transformational impact, inclusive growth that we're looking for. So yes, indeed, the, the pandemic has jolted us out of the illusion that the status quo is going to last or that is ever going to be sustainable. And truly um, only a reset of our minds, um, only a reset of how we think can really bring the revival and transformation that we're looking for. Um, Thank you. And I'm really uh, grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. And I'm very glad we resolved the, the tech troubles because that is a very, very important um, point that you just made. All of you have mentioned the need for new metrics. All of you have mentioned the need for new solutions and new standards for this new context that we're in. And all of you have mentioned the need for public-private collaboration and partnerships. I want to turn this over. Our work is just beginning. And I want to turn this over to our founder and executive chairman to share with us his views on the new emerging features of the social contract that we need for this new economy, for this new society that we all want to try to build together. Professor Schwab, over to you for final words and for bringing this summit to a close. Thank you very much, Sadia. Uh, since the time is running out, uh, and I think the uh, global shapers have very well summarized uh, what happened. Um, and of course, all those aspects have to be part of a new or revised uh, global social contract, global, national, and of course, uh, uh, local social contracts. But the point I want to make is when we look at the definition of a new social contract, of course, we want to uh, define policies to address all the issues. But what is important for me, if I look particularly at the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, to a certain extent also uh, of the, if I look at the disruptive nature of and the structural change, which we the fellow of COVID, I think we should use the social contract as an expression of the transition of one world to another world. Um, when we look back, uh, we are still living in the age, to a certain extent, of the first, second, and third industrial revolution. Our life is still determined by um, production and consumption. But um, if we look at the rays of, let's say, uh, technologies which will facilitate work, which will take over work, not replace us, I think the key um, narrative which we should have is to move from a society which is built on production and consumption to a society which is built on caring and sharing. I think if we can integrate those two notions into the new social contract, then we really have changed the page, I turned the page. And actually, it's needed because um, the technological forces um, provide us with this great opportunity uh, to go to a new, and I'm a very, um, I'm a, how shall we, as you see, I'm an optimist. Um, I believe a, a better future. I think uh, the history of humankind is going, uh, even if there are setbacks, but. Uh, from achievement to achievement. And the next achievement should be to build a society of sharing and caring. So let me conclude this is, um, summit also by saying, um, 
it is just a step um, in a process. And actually, Sadia, you have already lined out uh, what should be the milestones of achievement in the next three years, um, in uh, 21, in 22, and in 23. We will also integrate uh, those discussions into our big um, reset initiative. So thank you all. Um, you have already um, given all the thanks uh, to, the, to the shapers. I would uh, like to join you in um, appreciating uh, to have you in the final session. I think it's symbolic. Um, of course, so many people have um, contributed to the success of uh, this meeting. And I think we can speak about the success looking at the engagement um, uh, everybody had. But I want to thank you, Sadia, and your team, because um, uh, four days uh, with so many sessions um, to, to um, you have shown uh, not only intellectual leadership with your team, but great passion, because I know uh, this is for you not just uh, one of the many, um, let's say, challenges. Uh, it's for you a passion. It's for your passion. And I would uh, end um, uh, because uh, uh, with, um, let's say, some hiccup in our Nigerian um, communication, um, I, I want to, um, to thank also the technical team because we are now in the age of um, virtual interaction and I think they have done a great job to make sure that uh, our interaction was always smooth. So thanks everybody. Um, you have our commitment. Uh, it was mentioned in, in one of the statements. You have uh, our commitment to act as an amplifying platform uh, to take all this output and to make sure that um, we achieve what we wanted to do, a world where everybody has a decent life and the decent life is also connected and intertwined with a decent job. So thank you and the very best to you all.